Can you put her name and put like a little note? They want y'all been plagued with some folks, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, good evening. Uh, Kathy, could you turn this down? Ron's not here. It's a little bit on the, it should be the number one. You'll see something bouncing in front of it there. Test, test, test. Check, check. Y'all just write them out, sign them. We'll take $200 in each check, 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 check. Okay, that should work. Thank you. Luther, I didn't know you were downstairs. I was, I was say, save you a hike. Yeah, well, how about that? Jason's upstairs. Tonight we're going to dive right into our tools for souls. If you've been wondering what this toolbox is right here, this is it. How many of you do not have a copy of this fine piece of paper right here? This is a tool to utilize scriptures and teaching other people. We've got some left here, I think. Maybe we don't, but we will get you some because we're going to need them. Let's see if they're here. No. Mrs. Bright, would you, would you go copy some more of these? How many of you do not have this with you tonight? We're going to actually write on it. So we probably need, go ahead and do 10 copies real quick. Okay, you've got this one here. Got one for me here. We'll get everybody a copy. Appreciate you being here tonight. If you're visiting the class, we have some visitors with us. Kathy's sister and brother-in-law are here with us, and it's good to see them. And we also have Jared and family here. And uh, every time I see your kids, Jared, they're growing. Are you still getting taller, too? Mom's not getting taller, are you? How's school? Good. Don't let me embarrass y'all just or anything like that. But anyway, we're happy you have our visitors with us, and it's good to see the members here. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about what's coming up. We had a chance last night, Kathy and I, did, to pass out flyers to about 40 people, and um, some of them said, wow, this is great. So I said, good, we'll, you know, we'll look forward to seeing you here. Um, the, the beautiful thing about this seminar is it does have an, a, an attraction to people in the denominational world because it's, they see it as something that's beneficial for them. And that's the advantage it has. And so if you haven't taken the opportunity or um, have additional opportunities to share that information, how many of you received an email from me with the flyer last week? If you didn't, let me know. We'll get you emails. You can take and forward that, share that. Also, if you've been on Facebook, you'll notice that both on my personal R.B. Linus Facebook page, as well as the church page, they're, are, they're posted, the flyers are posted. You can just share those with your friends. The more you share it, the more it gets shared, the more the word gets out. So please do what you can to spread the good news. Now we're going to be coming together this Friday night. Friday night, he'll start the seminar. He'll continue it Saturday, 
and then Sunday as well, in Sunday morning class, as well as in the, the Sunday morning uh, service. So he'll be um, staying with the same theme throughout. The Saturday morning, is a, it's an individual presentation that's going to focus on aging and the learning process of the brain, or the learning process in aging. And I've encouraged the school teachers to share that with folks at school. Um, if you, you find a means to make that happen, because it's something that's it's of interest to everybody, especially to senior citizen. It's got the intention of a lot of the seniors. We're going to hope we see a lot of them there. Uh, Luther, you Saturday night too, though, right? Yes, yeah, Saturday night will continue at 7 o'clock, Friday night at 7. The, the seminars here at the building will be related in, through the series that he's presenting. Saturday will be a, 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 a individual presentation that will focus on a little bit different aspect in the relationship to talk topic. And that was set up to attract people who may not come to our building but would go to a location like the Senior Center. And so we're going to pray and hope and we ask you to pray that that is affected. The good news is there's a limited amount of seating there and we hope we fill it and have people standing uh, room only. And if you would have the time on Saturday morning if you can come to the Senior Center early and the seminar starts at 10. If you can be there by 9 o'clock, we'll get the tables and everything set up. Some of us already be there getting things ready, but if you can, can be there a little bit early, that would be great for, for making sure everything's ready to go for that presentation. It's an unknown. We don't know if we're going to have 10 people or 100 people, 200 people. And we'll hope 1,000, but we just don't know. The, 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 yes, well, the pre presentations will be on Facebook. Um, I don't know if we'll live stream them or if we'll just record them at this point. The one on Saturday morning will be recorded. It will not be live streamed, but it will be recorded, Lord willing. And the reason I'm, we want to, um, maybe we'll not live stream them, something the elders have to talk about tomorrow. but. We want people here at the building, not staying home watching it. So um, we'll see how that goes. We'll let the elders decide what's the best way to make that happen. Any other questions about the seminar? Should be plenty of flyers left in the back. If, you, if we run out, we'll get some more. Ladies will be meeting tomorrow um, here at the building. If you ladies need more flyers, let me know. And, if you're energetic and you want to do what we did the other Saturday and just make your neighborhood, uh, if you haven't done so, just handing out flyers in the door, that works because it's self-explanatory. Uh, if, if even if you just leave them at the door, don't get to talk to anybody. So do what we can to get the word out. The, the seminar for the Saturday was in the newspaper, and so they know about that. But, but our seminar is strictly that we're doing here at the building has been strictly what we advertise and the word we spread, so it's up to us to make that happen, of course. Now, let's look at this sheet here. Everybody get a copy? And hopefully you've got your Bibles with you and a pencil. Anybody need a pencil to write with? We can probably come up with some of those. The session, for those of you that are visiting, has been relative to this toolbox right here. We're looking at tools for souls, as you can see from the board. And what we're talking about is that the scripture is the power. And when we go to, into all the world, we are to preach the gospel. What's the basis for that gospel? It comes from what? The word of God, the scriptures. And what we're looking at is tools that can help us teach the word of God. And not just for a experienced personal worker, an experienced elder, an experienced deacon, an experienced preacher, but for everybody, a tool that we can use. And, and this box is going to be tools that anybody can take advantage of. In fact, we'll have tools that we'll be going over that's similar to this. You don't even have to speak a word. You just share. And we'll be looking at some of those tools. But tonight, I'm sharing with you a tool that is a good Bible study. It's not offensive to people, but yet teaches them what is necessary for them to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because one of the problems we have 
as we think about sitting down with somebody and talking to them, maybe they're a friend, a relative, a brother, sister, whoever, one of the challenges we have is deciding what we're going to tell them, what we're going to teach them, how we can best teach them. And so this is one of those tools that we can sit down with somebody and, and teach them and do so in a non-offensive manner, showing love as we teach them and concern, but also cover what is essential in reference to the church and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We started out looking at questions, and I don't want to go over those tonight because I want to get into the study. As you look at the scriptures, there's two sections uh, in this little box here that says importance of study. I recommend if you use this to, to go over these scriptures with the people you're studying with because the first part talks about the importance of the truth. John 8, uh, 32, you should know the truth, the truth will set you free. And Acts 17, 11, time of this ignorance God winked at but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So people need to know the truth. And then it's important that we study. And, of course, when you consider that probably this study is aiming at people who have knowledge of God, they understand that Jesus is the Son of God, and they believe that the Bible is God's Word. That's what this study is primarily designed for. So these are people who have a, a, a good, some knowledge of the truth. And we looked at a, a quote of Priscilla, and they're teaching Apollos. And we're going to look at that some more, Lord willing, Sunday night. But just as a review, what was unique about Apollos? He's in a synagogue, and, he, and he's encountered by Aquila and Priscilla. He was very knowledgeable in eloquence. Yeah, he was the eloquent man, knowledgeable in, the, in uh, the scriptures, and he was an honest heart, wasn't he? But his knowledge was limited. And in fact, what did they find out about him? He only knew of John's baptism. And so they saw opportunity, and what did Aquila and Priscilla do with Apollos? And we talked about the value of taking someone aside. They didn't rebuke him publicly in the synagogue. That would have been out of place. But they took him aside. So they didn't build a wall, in other words. And so they had a discussion with him. And they were able to further teach him. We asked the question, what would you teach him? Well, if he only knew the baptism of John, what was he missing? Right, he was missing New Testament baptism into Christ. And so they were going to complete his knowledge. And of course, they could have quoted Old Testament scripture to reiterate that the Messiah had come and proved to them that the Jesus that he was probably had some knowledge of as being the criminal on the cross was actually the Messiah. I, 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 I have to wonder, you know, when you think about Apollos, where was he on Pentecost? Very probable he wasn't there, was he? Yeah, remember John's, and we'll go into that Sunday night, but uh, more, Lord willing. But John was teaching the coming of the kingdom, not that the kingdom had come. So there were some things missing. So anyway, they went ahead and taught him further. And that's the design of this, is to take somebody that doesn't have complete knowledge and move them forward so that they have a good understanding of the church and what it takes to become a member. So that's what we're going to get into tonight. And there's a few blanks here, and I'm going to ask you to fill them out and some of the folks to read scriptures. So, um, Larry Chafin, would you read Matthew 16, 18, or quote it, and then fill in the blank for us. And, Dan, if you would, would you read Ephesians 1, 20, 10, 23 here in a moment? I'm ready. And so Jesus made clear to Peter that upon this rock, Jesus said, I'm going to do what? On this rock, I am going to build my church. Now, was Peter the rock of the church? What was the rock? 
the confession that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus made it clear. He says, I will build my church. And the New King James, my is capitalized. What's that emphasizing? It was ownership. His, my church, his possessive. And so Jesus promised to build blank what? His church. When you sit down with somebody, they will not miss this. I've never had anybody not give me the right answer. Simple, isn't it? Jesus said, I will build my church. And that also at this point, if you want to take a little bit of time, you can discuss the word church if you want to, but it's going to become clear. There's a lot of folks, when they think of the word church, what do they think of? A universal church or a denominational organization. Some even think the building. You know, we, we learned when we were little kids in Bible class, here's the church, here's the steeple, open up. You see all the people, but that didn't really tell you anything, does it? Because people get confused about this thing with the steeple. So I might give you a chance to, to, to really to ask them questions to bring out their understanding of what the church is. But then we go to Ephesians. And the good part of this study is that from this point, uh, for a while, we're going to stay right there in Ephesians. So it makes it an easy study in, that people can follow along and go through the book uh, of Ephesians looking at some very important facts that are revealed about the nature of the church. So, Dan, if you would, read Ephesians 1, uh, 22 and 23. So at this point, I want them to fill in the blank. So let's, let's do it. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. And there's a very important fact that follows. The church, which is his what? Body. And that's going to come into play in just a moment. But what we want to know, who is this that is being spoken about who is head of the church. You see over there, you've got the little body, you've got the, 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 uh, the word, or in yellow on the slide, blank is head of the church. Who is head of the church? Christ. And then I sometimes ask folks, didn't you hear that the Pope said he was head of the church? Could he be head of the church? Is that what we read? No, they'll go, no, it's, it's Christ the head of the church. And so they'll write that down. That's what we want folks to do is to understand that Christ is head of the church. And then as we pointed out in verse 23, below the head, the church is the what? Body. So the church is the body, and that's why we have the head and the body illustration. The church is the body of Christ. And, and once again, these are easy questions with easy answers, not difficult. And what are we doing as we discuss the church being the body of Christ with him as head? We're using an analogy for what reason? Of course, it's Paul's analogy too, isn't it? It's not just ours. But what's Paul doing? Right, he's given us something we can understand. Because it can never be too simple. For most of us tonight, you can, you can answer these questions without reading the scriptures. But simple's good, isn't it? Because the gospel isn't hard. It's actually very simple. You've got to work at misunderstanding. But we've got people who's been somewhat misled because they don't hear the scriptures and oftentimes they've never studied Ephesians looking at the church and the things that are said about it. So we have now Christ's head, the church is his body. We can go then to Ephesians chapter 4. And Luther, would you read chapter 4 for us? Verses, in a, and to get the context, it's always pretty good to go back to start when you're this close to the front. Um, would you read verses 1 through 6 for us? 
Okay, so here we have a blank. The body is one. And as you look at this passage, though, there's several things we can learn. What do we learn when we read this discussion of the oneness? Not only is there one body, but we also learn there is one spirit. How many hopes? One. one. And how many lords? One. one. How many faiths? So, how many baptisms? One, and that's important that they read that. And, and even though we're looking at the church being one, and that's the answer we're seeking here, what are they learning when we read this passage? Some very important, significant facts that's going to be related to their understanding and ultimate, we hope, their obedience to the gospel. And so also we have one God and Father of all who is above all. So they can understand that. One God, one, one body. So if there's one body, how many churches? And you might ask the question at this point, how come we have all these buildings with different names on it all over town? And we've already discussed something up here in Matthew uh, 15, 8 through 10, Matthew 7, 15, 2 Peter 2, 1. What brings about all the division in the religious world? And I'll go back and usually emphasize this. They don't want Jesus to be. Well, right. But one of the things that brings this about, the reason we have the disunity is because of what kind of teachers? false teachers, and we've already talked about that, so we, it's a good place to emphasize that. So the body, the church is one. Now, we learn something in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, that's very vital to our understanding. And Scott, you got that where you can read it? Read Ephesians 5, 23. Okay, so who's head of the wife? Well, Christ is the head of the wife. Husband. And who's head of the husband? Christ. Well, who's head of the church? They've already answered that, but you're asking it again. Because they're reading it, aren't they? For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And because... Christ loved his church. He was willing to sacrifice himself for it, just like a husband is willing to sacrifice himself in love for his wife. I always say that. The husband's going, really? Yes, really? For the husband's head of the wife's, as also Christ is head of the church. And then there's an important fact that follows, and this is what we're after. Christ is... Obviously, head of the body, but that's not the answer we're wanting here. You'll notice a little bigger blank. What is Christ to the body? Savior. He's the Savior of the body. And so Christ is head. The church is Christ's body. The body is one, and he is going to save the church, the body of Christ. He's the Savior. Now, here's the question. How do we get into that body? And, and wouldn't that be the place we'd want to be? Of course it would be. Somebody read, uh, let's see, just kind of going around here. Haley, would you want to read 1 Peter 3, 21?
Okay, there's an any type. And as you look at verse 20, what's he talking about? Read verse 20. Okay, so now we have introduced to them a couple of important facts, but we're going to focus at this point on the ark. And you'll see it's right here in the center of the page. And this is where I like to emphasize that those eight souls who went into that ark, when the floods came, they were saved from drowning. What about those outside the ark? They drowned. Where was salvation for those people when the floods came? Not, if they were outside of the ark, those that were in the ark, the only way they were saved is because where were they? In the ark. Now, when it comes to the church, where do we want to be? In the church. Because Christ is the savior of that body. So the question then is, how do we get into the church? And here's a fair question. Don't you want to be Saved in the church? Who's going to say no after what we've read? So that is important for them to understand. So then we deal with the question, how do we get into it? Well, let's start with Acts 2. And if I can get, um, Roy, would you read Acts 2, 37 and 38 for us? Yes. So Peter has a question to answer, and it's a very important question. What must we do, or what shall we do? And Peter returns with the answer, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And there's a reason. What is that reason? For remission of sins. But what must a person do before they're baptized, according to Peter? They must repent. What's repentance? This is something people often don't understand. Right. And Acts 17, 30, 31 gives us a good place to go to explain repentance. Because at the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now call, commands all men to repent. Now, it's good for them to know that there are commands to repent. Can a person be pleasing to God without repentance? No. What was Peter, uh, Paul wanting those people there to understand? that they must change what? And Acts 17 is a good place to explain that they were idol worshipers and that in verse 30, 31, somebody read 30 and 31 for us. Let's just put it, we want to go there. Haley, go ahead. There you go. You know, so Jesus died. He was resurrected. And we're going to face a judgment. And it's going to be very, very important that we repent or make a change in our life. And then we can go back if necessary. If they don't understand that, to point out that they were idol worshipers. And they had to change the direction of their life. They had to leave that life for the Christian life. 
And of course, it also gives us an opportunity, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Romans 6 in a little bit, but it gives us an opportunity to talk about sin a little bit. Because repentance involves a change of life that leads us away from sinning to following Christ. But it was a requirement according to Acts 2, verse 38. And also it's important to point out in Acts 2, 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, and they were going to receive something very essential. And I want them to know, tell me what it is that he promised them. Yes, but before that, he promised them what? Remission of sins. And then, Janet, with that came the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, has in their mind something they may not be really familiar with, and that's baptism and its importance. And they see a connection there with baptism and remission of sins. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. So who, who read last? Randy, have you read yet? All right, so what do we learn is essential there, according to the Apostle Paul? Faith first, and then what occurs? And many of you as have put on Christ in baptism. And so, and why be baptized? What do we know? Well, Acts 2.38, 4. But it's also important in Galatians 3 to point out that little four-letter word. For as many of you as have been baptized into who? Christ. And you want to emphasize that into. So what puts us into Christ? It says baptism. And of course that must require faith. And then now, Mark 16, 15, 16. Uh, let's come over here. Ron, would you read that for us? Mark 16, 15, and Very good, and this is, this is going to be a vital passage for them to understand. He that believeth, as the King James says, he that believeth, or he that believes, and is what? Shall be saved. And I want them to give me the answer. He that believes and is what? Baptized shall be? And if a person then doesn't believe anything, and we went out to your, in front of your house and grabbed him and well, you had your bathtub full of water and we dunked them in there baptizing. Would it mean anything to them? Is it essential they believe before they're baptized? It's also taking care of infant baptism, isn't it? When I was studying with Dennis, I, I didn't even have to point that out. He said to me, if I'm correctly might recall, a baby can't believe. So what about infant baptism. It's like grabbing the guy off the street that doesn't even know what he's doing and putting him in the water. But it says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you don't believe, what's going to happen? You're going to be condemned. But if you believe and are willing to be baptized, you shall be saved. How are they saved? Because we are baptized into Christ, wherein is salvation. Remember what happened to those folks outside of the ark? They perished. Who was saved? Those in the ark. And then Romans 6, 1 through 5. Uh, Nacho, you want to read that for us? You don't want to read? Okay. Beverly, go ahead.
Very good. So here we got a passage that's beautiful because it, it really fills in an understanding of baptism, Paul, with his discussion there. And do you see the word into anywhere? What, what, what does it connect into with? With Christ. And also with what? We're buried by baptism into his death. And then we're buried, raised to walk in a newness of life. And so clearly you have that description of what baptism is all about. We're buried with Christ. We're raised to walk in a new life. And that's a new life because what's happened to our sins? Remember Acts 2.38? We're all washed away for remission of sins. In fact, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Leon, you want to read it? So we have all kinds of sins described there. Uh, idolaters, fornicators, homosexuals, and uh, sodomites in the New King James, thieves, they're covetous, drunkards, and extortioners, revilers. They're not going to inherit the kingdom, but he says some of you were like those, but things changed because you were sanctified, justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How were they sanctified and justified? Well, Acts 22, 16 will help us understand. Um, Paul, you want to read that? We'll not pick on Jerry or Wanda. So when a person is baptized into Christ, what happens to his sins? Washed away. They receive a remission of sins. They enter the body, and they go into Christ through baptism, into the body, which is one, which is the church, where the salvation is. And those outside of the body, do they have any hope unless they repent through faith and be baptized for remission of sins, to have their sins washed away? No. And are these questions difficult for people to understand with the passages they've just read? And I encourage you, when you study with somebody, if at all possible, let them read for themselves. Most folks will read, some won't, but that's okay. But if they read it themselves out loud, what ha tends to happen? They're focused on it. They'll, they'll catch more of the passages. And then it brings us to, yes, Absolutely. And they're going to think it's from you and not from what? Because we want them to see everything that we're reading is coming from the book. And, and the words that we're using are from the book. Exactly right, Roy. That's, a, that's a, true. And that brings us to the closing. Uh, if you consider the importance of... of calling for response, it causes them to think about their needs. And one of the passages I like to use is Romans 3, 9. Have them read that. What then? Are we better than they? No, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jew and Greeks that they are all under sin. Man does not escape that. And that's a good place for them to, to read that. And then verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this is a good place to simply ask the question, what about your sins? Have they been washed away? 
Have you remission of sins? And most people there will tell you yes. And this brings up the time to review. And we go back to these questions. What did we ask them? What was their salvation experience? How were they baptized? What was the method? How old were they? That tells us a lot. And this question then, the next one, did this happen after you believed you were saved or had a salvation experience? Were you saved and then two or three weeks later baptized? If they understand they were saved before baptism, what does that tell us? That's like Apollos. When they heard him speak, they realized he only knew what? And it wasn't that his heart wasn't sincere, it was. He just didn't have complete knowledge. And if they say they're saved before they were baptized, then that tells us there's, there's incomplete knowledge. And so this is a good time to review what they said before. And then when you, they do that, you compare what we read here. Those folks who were baptized in the New Testament understood that baptism was for what reason? And I will want them to tell me, and you know, they'll remember it most of the time. Well, remission of sins, to wash sins away. And if not, you emphasize that. Also, it's a good time to look at Acts 2, verse 47. It's one example. You point out that those that were baptized into Christ were added to the church which is important. And that's the need to be in Christ's body where you emphasize that. And, I, and I, I'm pretty bold. I'll just say um, I'm really concerned. And Jerry knows this as well because we, we have studied some of this, if not this one. I'm concerned. And you remember, they're learning truth too. And truth is powerful. And I, I will tell them I'm really concerned. And what you told me is not what we just read, is it? And then it gives you another chance to review. Because you really want them to come to the knowledge of it, don't you? You, you? you can tell somebody something, but that doesn't necessarily believe they get it. But if they read it, they have a better odd or opportunity to, to be able to read it. And it also gives you a chance to figure out maybe where they're missing knowledge. You may want to go back and review maybe some other passages, but this is a, a tool that is, is good for somebody who has some knowledge that needs to be taught more perfectly. Any questions, comments, time's up, but I don't want to run away from this. Lord willing, next Wednesday we'll be looking at another tool. I'll be handing out some booklets that you will get. They're actually going to be about this big. You're going to get three of them, and we'll uh, Take a look at that tool and how it can be used to teach people that are lost. Thank you all for your kind attention. Jeff, can you grab this here off of me? I've still got it on.
Good evening. Good to see a nice, nice big crowd on a rainy evening. Uh, Charlotte was uh, gracious enough to get us some more of these slide drill, um, I call them cheat sheets, I don't know, but they're great. Uh, it's got all the subjects on there, one church, Church of Christ, baptisms, and, and all kinds of good stuff. And you can just kind of go up and down and come up with the verses that kind of help you, you know, it's, it's your own self, but especially if you're studying somebody and it covers so many good topics. So we had a few here a week or two ago and we run out and then like I said, Charlotte got us some more. So if anybody needs some of these, uh, Bob will hand them out. If you raise your hands, I'll have him hand them out while I'm continuing announcements. So if you would, just go ahead and raise your hands and I'll go ahead. We got quite a bit on the announcements. Um, Michelle Ipock has had her surgery and, and doing better. And so we're thankful for prayers there. Um, Linda DeVick could get to come home. I didn't get, to, okay, she did not get to come home. So we need to continue to obviously keep Vicky in our prayers. As mentioned Sunday, we need to continue on Andrew Barnwell. Uh, that situation is uh, in, as a surgeon, the doctor said that's in God's hands now, so we need to pray for him and pray for that family, continue to do so. Louise Waldron, uh, Larry Chaffin's aunt, at nursing home in, at Kennett, needs, needs our prayers. Um, on a sad, sad note, Marvin's niece, niece's husband, um, and I failed to get the name, but uh, he passed away, and they're, they're the couple that was dealing with the COVID, and uh, she's doing better, but, but unfortunately he's passed away, so need to keep uh, Marvin and that family in our prayers. Pardon me? Okay. Also, uh, remember uh, the card shower for Sunday. If you have any questions on this, uh, please see Linda. Um, Bob and Kay's house on October 23rd at 4 o'clock for bonfire and hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, bring chips or anything that goes with that and bring a pumpkin. We'll find out why later. As far as this weekend coming up, as, as a reminder, uh, it's, the event actually starts Friday night, but they will need some help Saturday uh, at the senior citizens building starting at 10 o'clock. There will be a seminar. And uh, as Rick said earlier, a uh, great time to invite somebody that's not maybe comfortable going in the church's door the first time. You know, maybe they've come to a neutral zone and, and then maybe something be said there. Also, along with that, that'll start at 10 o'clock and, and there'll be a luncheon after that. And if you would get with Ruth, needing uh, cookies, brownies, f you know, just finger desserts. If you have any questions, get with Ruth. Uh, then again, Sunday, the fellowship meal will be at the Senior Citizen Building again. Meat, loaf, chicken, pot pie, and mashed potatoes and gravy will be served. And then again, from the congregation, they could use some side, side vegetable dishes, salads, and desserts. Need to continue keep Tim for sure's uh, family in our prayer. Keith's still in the hospital in uh, Virginia's home and, and doing a little bit better than last I knew. Um, Jerry had said that Jeff was doing better, so we're thankful for answered prayers there. I think it might be all I have. Um, we, uh, as of this afternoon, we've got 17 now lined up for Sunday for baptisms at the jail. And so if you can help, 
uh, please come Sunday because we're going to, they don't think they'll get them all through there, but if we have extra help, maybe, that, maybe that'll maybe that help us. So those of you that uh, are qualified to go uh, or want to get qualified to go, uh, please con consider doing that and, and pray for those people. Uh, Rick's lesson tonight and, and all he's been doing here the past several weeks just you know, it just mirrors what we try to do, and God's been given the increase. And we even take a step farther, and, and Rick, I know we'll get to this, but, you know, we try to get them to count the cost to have them look at Romans 6, 4 through 6, and, or Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, and Hebrews 10, 29, and 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21, places like that. You know, so that they understand that this is a commitment, and and so they're getting the whole they're getting the whole gospel uh, I think Paul says I've not shunned, shunned to declare you the whole gospel and that's what they're getting and, and they're still wanting to be baptized so pray for them people and pray for the jailers that we get this done thank you let's go to God in prayer Holy Father we're again so deeply grateful that you let us gather here this evening, Father, to sing songs of praises to you, Father, to study your word, Father, to hear a, a devotional, Father, to you. Father, we're so thankful for the avenue of prayer and the answer prayers on so very many, but our prayer list is continue to grow and we continue to ask your healing hands and be at the doctors and nurses and caregivers that's caring for all these people. Father, especially be with those that may be spiritually lost. And Father, the Bible study is going on weekly here and, and Father, around the world, Father, that, that uh, we sow the seed and water that you might give the increase. Please forgive us if we have sin in our lives. You hear and answer our prayers and help us try to imitate your son in all we do, that you receive the honor and glory. It is in his precious name we pray, amen. We'll grab the songbook, turn to number 885. 885. We'll sing this before the lesson this evening. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's Bye. 
song after the lesson will be number 939. Before I get into what I have to say, folks, you have no idea how grateful I am for this congregation. I have no idea how many people have contacted Kathy Howes Clayton. I have, she have, you have no idea. You know how, how good that makes you feel? Even when you don't feel good? But in the process, folks, over the last week, Kathy, have I improved any? She's shaking her head, yes. And uh, you know, when, the, when I went to the doctor on Monday and he told me what my problem was, it was, it was if I had AFib, it wasn't enough to, to worry about. And he cracked me, he told me what to do. You know what? I left there with a smile on my face. I thought I was gonna have to have that fourth shock, and I didn't. But I'm thankful for, the, for, for you and your prayers and your, and your, and your kind words and your and your many, many inquiries. Thank you, I love you all. Now, what Rick was talking about tonight is basically, I'm gonna give a recap, but I'm gonna do it in one passage. Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. One of the greatest passages of the New Testament, in my opinion, I like Hebrews chapter, matter of fact, I like the book of Hebrews, but in Hebrews chapter 10, Starting in verse 19, the writer says, therefore. To me, what that therefore means, I said all that I said before to make this point. And then in this concept, remember what Rick's been teaching us on Sunday. And I've been taking, talking about, about Jesus being the high priest, Jesus being, you know, all these different things, a better covenant, all these things. We're going to discuss these right here in about five verses and how powerful it is. But listen to what he says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the, high, the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, the high place, that was the only, the only more than God in there was the high priest. But you and I are allowed to enter there. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. But he goes on and explains it one more step. He says, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Do you remember what happened to the veil, the actual veil when Jesus died? It split from top to bottom, remember? It split. What did that show? What separated man from the throne of God now was gone. By what? By the blood of Jesus. That veil now is gone. And he said, why or how was it? Because Jesus offered his flesh. And before his flesh was nailed to that cross, what did he lose? He lost blood. And as he hanged there, remember the, the spear to the side and the blood came? Okay, we're foreshadowing now what he's fixing to say. And since, look at verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, that great priest in, implies the high priest. But as Rick has already told us, that's impossible for Jesus to be a high priest. Matter of fact, it's impossible for Jesus to be a priest Wrong tribe, right? But the thing is, Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, who came before the law did. And what did God say that he was? A priest of God most high. And remember what he did? He blessed Abraham. Well, here he is. We now have a great high priest over the house of God. The house of God is what? The church. 
Our high priest is not over the law. Our high priest is not over the synagogue. Our high priest is over the church. And what, what did all this? His blood. His blood. All right, now go. Go to verse 22. So there are three verses here that I want to look at particularly. In verse 22, he says, let us. Now, that's kind of a nice way of saying, Clayton, do it, right? Let us draw near with a sincere heart in the full assurance of faith. When you and I draw near to God, what's, going, what's Satan going to do? Oh, he's going to flee. He's going to flee because what? God's already whipped him. He whipped him, you know, he, he brought the Israelites in. He brought Jesus to the throne. He tried, couldn't stop that. He took on Jesus himself, took him in the wilderness and tempted him. Jesus pinned his hide to the wall. But then he says, hey, the Revelation letter says in chapter 12 and verse 17 that now he's going to make war with us. He can't whip, can't whip God, can't whip Jesus, but he's sure going to tangle with us. But here he is here. Let us, beautiful words, let us draw near with a sincere heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. All right. A couple of terms we need to look at there. This idea of sprinkling, a lot of religious people today say you can be sprinkled, baptized by sprinkling. Folks, at eight days old. Mom said, I made the most awful racket you ever heard. And I can imagine, eight days old, getting water splashed on you? Then when I was 12, I had a wet sponge placed in my forehead. And then I became a member of that denomination. But when I was 19 years old, the man who's going to be my father-in-law baptized me into Christ. I was immersed. I was immersed. Now, when we do this, our hearts, what did the high priest have to do before he could make a sacrifice? He had to make a blood offering, take a hyssop branch, sprinkle himself all the tools before he could go make that atonement sacrifice. So we're having the blood sprinkled on us, figuratively, and we're being washed with pure water. Acts 22 verse 16. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. All right. Here we go. What did Paul tell, uh, tell uh, isn't that amazing? You get 71 years old and your mind just go blank instantly. Uh, Jesus told in that I've written. You know what I bet about halfway home I'm gonna think of it. I'm gonna yell real loud. So you guys just have your windows down a little bit, you'll hear me explain. But here he said, Hey, you must hey, you must be uh, both water and spirit. Water and but Nicodemus. Whoever said it, thank you. About six hands went up. I'm glad you're more aware than I am. Okay, boy, I could have had a V8, couldn't I? But here we go. We're having our hearts cleansed from an evil spirit. Hey, folks. Second Peter chapter three and verse 21. What did he say? Baptism does now save us, not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answering of a good conscience. And how is that conscience 
cleansed by baptism. When we're saved, we're baptized. When we're saved, we're washed. And we're having that conscience cleansed. And we're having our hearts sprinkled. And we're having our bodies washed in pure water. Now look at verse 23. That was the, that was the first let us. Here's the second one. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. What confession did you make when you were baptized into Christ? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the only way that our baptism is going to work if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now listen to what he said. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Jesus is the only hope we have. Without wavering, never doubt it. Jesus is there working for us. For he who promised is faithful. And then the third let us. This one, this one here makes most of us uncomfortable, and it needs to. Look what it says. Let us consider how to stimulate one another in love and good deeds. Folks, there's not a thing wrong with spurring on good things. This is the idea of a, of a cowboy sitting on a horse, giving him the spurs. Giving the spurs to do what? First thing is to love. By love, we prove that we are his disciples, right? Now, by love and what else? Good deeds. Folks, there's only two type deeds to do, good deeds and bad deeds. But the thing is, what did, he, what did uh, Jesus tell John there in the, first, the seven, letters, uh, seven letters to the congregations there in, Acts, in Revelation 2 and 3? In every one of them, the first thing he says, I know your works. Hey, folks, our, our deeds are important. Our work is important. We need to spur each other on to love and to work. We can't be a congregation of pupitators. We have to be a congregation of workers. Then he says, not, okay, not forsaking of our own assembling together. You mean we are commanded to come together? That's what he said. Not forsaking the assembling of yourself together as the habit of some is. Isn't that a horrible statement to make? I mean, some members who claim to be members of the Lord's body purposely miss? Don't do it, he says. But, this is the reason why you need to try to attend. But encouraging one another and all the more to when you see the day coming. When's your day coming? Did you understand what he meant by that? We don't know when Jesus is coming. He might, might come today. I don't think he might. I don't think he will, but he might. But as an individual, when will your day come if Jesus doesn't come first? It's when you, when you pass on. Be ready for that day. Be ready when for that day? Now. Now. Folks, well, you've got to be ready now. As Rick keep him, he emphasized it three or four times tonight. Do not leave here tonight if you are not absolutely, totally sure. Absolutely, totally sure, Sherry that you are now right in the sight of God. Any questions? I hope not. That's pretty blunt, wasn't it? Pretty plain, wasn't it? The time is tonight. Well, why not tonight?
that's the, the song that, that Jeffrey has chosen for us to sing, and you can't ask a better question. If you're not in Christ tonight, don't leave until you are. If you have any questions, anything you need to be discussed, there's several of us that will be glad to do that with you. If we can help you tonight, why not tonight as we stand and as we sing? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening that we might gather here. Father, we thank you for the encouragement, the edification, that, and the fellowship that we have. Father, we would ask again that you would be with those among us who are sick. Father, we thank you so much for their healing, for the operations, the therapies, Father, we'd ask that you would continue to be with their doctors that care for them. And Father, we'd ask that you would go with us to our separate homes. In your son's name, amen.